for it. So we have kind of two parts in the college of theology, and now it's the time of the disciples to be talked about the campus. The disciple to give the talk is Jay Watson, and uh, he will tell us about A versus C in the landscape of all these SCFTs. Please do that. Um, thank you very much. So uh, I, it's uh, really a privilege and honor to speak at uh, congratulating Hiroshi's 60th uh, birthday. And uh, I, I knew that this day would eventually come, but I feel a little bit surreal that now it's this day. So um, I tried to find a picture of, of both of us, and there is a one. Oh, sorry. So this. Oh yeah. Yes, this one. So uh, this this picture was taken at Caltech. Uh, I think this was year two thousand seven. Uh, near uh, Hiroshi's office, say Hiroshi's office. I don't know. At Caltech, and uh, these are Hiroshi's students, disciples. And uh, this is me. They look way younger than right now. And Hiroshi is looks still young. <laughs> I feel aged, uh, but Hiroshi is not. Uh, and that was 15 years ago. And around that time, uh, the IPMU just got started. And uh, like Hiroshi and Mr. invited many people in Caltech to visit IPMU uh, when the institute only had this, it had a big container box. Uh, and uh, there's a packet uh, with IPMU without K. Uh, still, it's a Exciting place to do research. In 2008, we just had a container box. Uh, and then if you actually get into this uh, container box, uh, there's a really large um, office space uh, with uh, plenty of interaction areas still uh, with this confined area. And it was also regular tea time uh, and served with very delicious cooking. And um, I was also super amazed by this very high tech machine that it had. It had a very big whiteboard with a scanner attached uh, and scanner and a printer attached. So like uh, we were uh, discussing, uh, we were writing some paper back then and like uh, we were discussing over the board and by pressing a button, it printed out the um, scanned uh, screenshot of the whiteboard. And that was very useful. And I was super amazed. I, I don't regularly keep diary, uh, but I, I, I was so impressed. So I actually wrote a, a, a diary art, uh, journal in um, that day, and I wrote about it mm -hmm. because I was so amazed. And uh, by the way, this picture is from this um, blog uh, by uh, ex post I King. Actually, I learned this from Yuji. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, it was hard for me to find the picture. It, it didn't have smartphone back then, so it couldn't take a picture. Um, yes, and then we wrote uh, this paper uh, about general gauge mediation. This is my uh, very first research paper, and still, so far, the only paper that I co-authored with Hiroshi, I, I hope uh, that that can be remedied, uh, remedied soon. Um, and it was a great, uh, great collaboration. I really love this work, and uh, just like any uh, graduate students, this had a huge impact on me as a, a physicist. Uh, it's not just a single paper, but all the behind the, the, the what Hiroshi taught me and throughout the discussions and through many, uh, his uh, influence on me is uh, like substantial. It's, it's not just about this paper. Oh, and I think uh, I think I saw you talk uh, in the audience. Yes. I don't know if he's still around. Uh, and and I also like to thank my collaborators on this paper. Anyway, so there's a uh, picture, of both of us. This is uh, the resolution is not that great. This is from Kiroshi's page, and also this is on the Caltech Telegram. This is already like ten years old. I can't believe that. Mm -hmm. Believe this. Like maybe you can recognize some of these people. Uh, I'm Jay mm -hmm. This is must be Christoph Keller. Mm -hmm. And it's, that's Piotr Surkowski. Yes. Yeah. This is Piotr and the, the middle. 
That's crystal. That's a Lashara. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Now coming back to the scientific part. Of, oh, one more thing is that so now I uh, I I worked at this uh, institute called KAIST Korean Advanced Institute for, of Science and Technology, and so far I'm the only uh, string theorist in this uh, at this institute. And I learned so I recently got a copy of Hirsch's uh, autobiography, and I read that. And uh, there's a very interesting remark by him. It says that his very first business uh, trip to oversee was to this institute. That, that was a very nice coincidence, and I'm very happy to know that. Uh, and um, I'm happy to uh, work at KAIST. And this is a local place in Daejeon. So Daejeon is the city where uh, the next string you know, meeting will happen. So everybody is welcome. Now let, let me go to the scientific part. Uh, so I'm going to talk about some you know, aspects of four-dimensional superconformity theories, and uh, try to focus on these two numbers, uh, the central charges, uh, commonly referred to as A and C. So uh, this was worked on with uh, these very various collaborators. Okay, so let me uh, briefly remind you about this quantum model is A and C. So the central charges for 40 CFPs. So the conformal anomalies for any four dimensional theories are parameterized by two numbers that are uh, commonly referred to as C and A. And uh, this number A uh, is known to uh, be a function that monotonically decreases of the renormalization group flow. So that is established, it's called A theorem. So loosely speaking, that counts. So Counts the numbers of degrees of freedom that a field theory possesses. And there's another quantity that's called C. Um, this is kind of, uh, this is quite similar to the A function. Uh, what is known is that C does not decrease along the, uh, does not always decrease along the R flow. But in for a restricted number of cases, C also behaves similar to, similar to A, but it's not always the case. So there's no C theorem. Uh, well, in 2D, there's a C theorem, but in 4D, there's only A theorem. Uh, and this ratio of A and C is not arbitrary. It is bounded, uh, it is constrained by unitarities, as was demonstrated by Hoffman and Malasena. Uh, this ratio, A over C, oh, this is a type of, so this must be one third. So A over C uh, uh, is bounded below by one third and above by 31 over 18. And the lower bound is saturated by a free scalar field and the upper bound is saturated by a free vector field. If you have supersymmetry, there's a restriction. The, the, the window becomes narrower. So for n equals one supersymmetry, it's between one half and three. And once again, the lower bound is saturated by a free chiral multiplane and the upper bound is saturated by a free vector multiplane. And if you increase supersymmetry, then it gets even narrower. So the lower bound becomes one half and upper bound becomes five quarter, where the upper bound is saturated by three vector multiple. And if you have even higher degrees of supersymmetry, and they have to be uh, they have to be identical. So as you all know, that n equals four super young males have same central charges A and C. Now these numbers are uh, uh, rather simple to compute, but basically counts the number of fields in a sense, uh, but it captures some interesting aspects of field theory. Uh, well, so the basic thing about the NC is that it's dual to uh, ADS gravity. Uh, ADS gravity. When uh, these two quantities are not equal, uh, it gives rise to a correction to this uh, celebrated entropy and viscosity ratio of constants on Steinman, where it's eta over s uh, is bounded below by one, one or four pi. But if a is not equal to c, there's a correction, so it can be lower, uh, depending on the sign of c uh, c minus a. Also, it's known that uh, these certain combination of central charges appear in the Cauchy-like limit of the superconformal index, uh, which captures the high energy asymptotic number of high energy states. And it's controlled by this particular combination. And uh, in, recent, in recent years, uh, this has been heavily investigated. 
uh, especially uh, regarding the uh, connection to the super entropy of supersymmetric black holes uh, in AES. Also, the C minus A appears in the universal part of entanglement and entropy, uh, which I learned from Eric, who is here. So A and C are uh, interesting. And my question, uh, so before posing the question, so if we, if we consider typical four-dimensional gauge theories uh, of rank N, the central charges typically grows quadratically in N. Uh, there, here, N square is really coming from the dimension of the gauge. So for a young mills type gauge theory, it's natural to expect that your degrees of freedom is counted by the matrix degrees of freedom. So it scales as N square. And it students, it's some bleeding. So it, it, at best, it would better be uh, O N. So that uh, quite generically, you expect that A and C uh, becomes identical in the large N limit, but not for a finite N. So my question is whether this is general. So is this scaling the A that A and C grows quadratically in N? Is it true for general CFT? general gauge theory, or can I find some kind of a universality for the sign of C minus A? And um, another question is that, is it always the, uh, the case where C minus A is of order N? Can you find like a more exotic case with the um, O1 degrees of freedom or something even more drastically A equals C for finite N? Um, what I had in mind is uh, when I uh, started to ask this question, my secret motivation is that can you formulate something like a, a swamp land conjecture for CFT? That was my that was my original motivation. Um, but unfortunately, I'm going to tell you that I'm not. I was not successful about in uh, coming up with a CFT swamp land conjecture because we find that there's no universality. So uh, let me first try to answer the first question. So the central charges for uh, of the, the scaling of central charges in N. So I'm going to achieve this by uh, systematically enumerating all possible large N uh, supersymmetric in series. It is uh, daunting with N equals one supersymmetry, but it's actually achievable under uh, some assumption. So that's what we're going to do. Let us try to classify all possible supersymmetric, supersymmetric large N gauge series in 40 with the following assumptions. First, uh, I, I'm going to assume the gauge group is simple. Okay, then uh, it really boils down to SU, SO, and SP because you cannot take large N limit for the exceptional groups. So that's simple. And I'm going to fix the flavor symmetry as we take the large N limit. So uh, this is kind of motivated uh, from the holography that in the, in the balls, uh, the flavor symmetry, the global symmetry, or the flavor symmetry of the uh, CFT is mapped to the gauge symmetry in the bulk. So it's a little bit weird to, uh, to look for the gravity dual where the, the rank of the gauge group scales as you dial the prompt. So I, I want to fix that, or uh, just fix the uh, gauge symmetry. And for simplicity, I'm going to ignore this coverage. And um, this program for n equals two gauge theory uh, without any of these assumptions is already achieved uh, in very nice paper by Laksha and Yuji many years ago, where they fully classify uh, all possible um, conformal n equals two supersymmetry gauge theories. So we are heavily inspired by that. And try to do that. Well, it goes down to group theory questions with extra, uh, extra constraints. First of all, is that uh, you need to have a uh, gauge anomaly should not be there, obviously. The triangle anomaly should vanish. And I, I want the theory to be interesting, so I demand the theory to be asymptotically free. So the, the beta function uh, coefficient should be positive like this. And uh, if I assume that the existence of large element, these two conditions uh, restrict the matter representations to only up to rank two tensor. 
So I can have like fundamentals or vectors and symmetric, anti-symmetric adjoints, but that's it. I cannot have like a exotic matters like <clears throat> rank three tensors uh, or like spinner representations in the, if, if I demand large enough. So that makes our job really easy. And then uh, we just need to solve this constraint. And apart, uh, in addition to that, we only, we're going to restrict to the, the theories that can possibly flow to super conformal okay. uh, And side note is that like the, the, uh, the conformal gauge theory has been classified in this very nice work by Shlomo and friends, Shlomo Gabi. Uh, but we are only, we are mainly concerned about the theories that flow to super conformal theory. And um, so in order to have super conformal symmetry, I need to have U on R symmetry. So I'm going to demand that uh, there is a R symmetry that is not anomalous. Uh, and that's also a group here and a constraint. And um, quite often your super conformal R charge, R charge is, cannot be determined um, just by uh, normally constrained. So this has to be, uh, this is achieved by this procedure called A maximization. Um, and that is a, a very simple task. You, you compute this trial A function, which is given in terms of trace anomalies, and you try you locally maximize this trial A function with respect to uh, various candidate R charts. So it, it really boils down to solving some quadratic equations. So that's uh, what we do. And one final uh, technical uh, part that is, I think that's quite important. This is the most technical slide. Uh, one important caveat in this procedure is that if there's an accidental symmetry uh, in, in your field theory, then the naive A maximization procedure can actually fail because it doesn't really include all possible mixing of the, of the R symmetry. Um, so that can be, uh, there's a signal for that by looking at the operator spectrum. So you first do the A maximization naively and evaluate the R charges of the field and check the unitarity of the chiral, uh, chiral operators. If there exists some operator that violates the unitarity bound, then that's a signal that something's wrong. And uh, the most possible scenario is that you start from um, the higher dimensional operator, it acquires anomalous dimensions along the flow, and the dimension typically gets smaller and smaller as you go along the RG flow. And as, it, as soon as it hits the unitary bound where delta equals one uh, for the scalar, then it becomes free. So that gets decoupled, and there will be accidental symmetry that only acts on this decoupled field. So in order to properly study the RG flow, I have to take that into account. So they get rid of, so technically, and can get rid of this decoupled field uh, by introducing uh, what's called flip field, the so additional chiral multiply, and then couple through this definition. Then the action for the X will kill uh, this, would be the couple operator. Mm. And we repeat this procedure over and over until we do not find uh, any unitary violating operator. Well, this is the only, this is the most technical part. And once we do, uh, you carry that out. Uh, this, this is the full list of SUN case series uh, under uh, my assumptions. There aren't that many actually. There are the four, so there are like the 20 classes of theories. There's one free parameter, NF, uh, that can be uh, that is uh, within this particular window that we call conformal window. Mm -hmm. And some of these theories are chiral and some of, some of them are non-chiral. And there's some under list for SO and SP gauge theory, similar, right? Mm. So it's a finite problem. So mm. it can be, it is achievable. Okay, now what? Did we learn? So let me zoom into one particular example. It's, pro it's probably the simplest. So I have SUN gauge theory with a fork uh, and anti-fork. So it's just a pair of fork and anti-fork and an adjunct. 
Um, this theory has uh, two U1 symmetries apart from R uh, that I call baryonic and uh, axial. And uh, the supercritical R charge is not fixed by the uh, anomaly constraint. So I have to use a maximization uh, to get it. But anyway, uh, this has a like, pretty simple set of uh, gauge and bearing operators, like trace pi to the n and the uh, mesonic operators are q phi, q twiddle. And there's like a, you can also form like gauge and bearing operators by concatenating more q's and q twiddles. And uh, our claim inside this theory uh, flow to a super conform fixed point in range. So it looks like a pretty mundane theory. Uh, but if you actually uh, try to get the R charge using a maximization, you found the uh, very surprising fact. Uh, we find that many uh, operators actually gets decoupled along the RG flow. Uh, for example, this operator of this form uh, and this form for a certain value of I gets decoupled along the RG flow. So this theory uh, turns out it flows to an interacting part plus many decoupled fields. And uh, so if I compute the central charges for this theory, it goes like this. So A and C scales linearly in N. So N squared gets canceled. Hmm. Hmm. So it grows linearly in F. Uh, and well, since A and C is of, of the same order, the ratio doesn't have to be equal. So it, it's pretty close to one, but it doesn't, uh, it never gets to exactly one. So this is quite bizarre. We started with uh, some gauge theory and found a theory that uh, does not seem to have the entire matrix degrees of freedom. So even more bizarre thing is that if you look at the uh, low line operator spectrum, so this horizontal axis is the rank of the gauge group N and this vertical axis is the scaling dimension of operators. So if I list the operators uh, along the fixed dimensions, as I take large n, it becomes dense, denser, and denser. So the reason for this dense spectrum is that the R charge for the adjoint field uh, scales as one over n. So this uh, energy spectrum, there's a gap that is uh, one over n. So it, it gets it close to, to zero as you take large n. So it's pretty bizarre. We seem to find a dense band of low line spectrum. For gauge theory, it's natural to expect that you get a sparse spectrum because they are formed by gauge invariant operators. So by concatenating many more quarks, you expect that things become heavier and heavier. But somehow, the, in the, if you consider this weird model, um, it doesn't get heavier. So mm -hmm. I don't know what to call it, but like this somehow reminds me of Liouville theory in 2D CFT. So I don't know if there's any, any connection. Um, so I can, okay, well, let me skip this part. So you, you, you can uh, slightly modify this theory by adding some superposition term as well. Uh, in, in this case, it's easier to analyze because, okay, maybe this is interesting to say that if you slightly modify the theory, it turns out that this theory flows to Arger's double S theory, in the paper, which has, uh, it has n equals two supersymmetry. And, much more is known about n equals two CFT than n equals one. So uh, it's kind of tantalizing that our previous model looks similar to some n equals one analog of Arger's double type theories instead of the um, usual SQCD in the uh, uh, in the conformal phase. So it not not like the non-abelian Coulomb phase. This might be more like a Arger's double type theory. Um, and well, we, so one, one more thing is that we actually, we also checked this, uh, the, uh, this large chain theory against the ADS version of the weak conjecture, conjecture, which was originally studied by uh, Yuna Kayama and, and Nomura. And uh, basically we just took their uh, formula and plugged into uh, their formula and checked that this weak gravity conjecture still holds. This is kind of bizarre because our theory is not really holographic. You don't really expect this theory to be holographically dual to some nice ADS gravity. But nevertheless, this weak gravity conjecture uh, seems to hold. 
I think that's a very interesting fact. How do you know it's not holographically dual? Oh, that's because the um, oh, the, C the spectrum that we call look really spectrum. Of course, the course does just the, in the strongest version of ADS CFT. Every CFT has to be dual to some some. Uh, yeah, but this is case that... shown only for the weekly couple of the back zero, right? Right. So the, I think the question is that, for example, if you restrict to the theory for which the spectrum is sparse, is this still the case that A over C goes to not not necessarily go to one? Oh, very good. So actually, for that, it it, it, always, it seems it always goes to one. So you say that for every for all the sparse spectrum, A, A over C goes to one. Oh. Now, among, among in this list of theories presented, yeah, uh, there, uh, so these are the sparse ones and these are the mm -hmm. dense ones. The sparse ones, A and C, are not equal in large n, but for the dense ones, A and C are equal in large n. So that's what we observe. So at least there is some kind of universal. <laughs> okay, good. So it passes the necessary condition. Mm -hmm. Thank you for the question. All right, so let me move on. So one more curious observation is that you can uh, consider more general theories and sometimes you get like a two distinct band-like structure. So I don't know whether this has anything to do. I think the band is just curious. So uh, what you find uh, to, con to, sum to summarize, what we found is that out of 35 classes of uh, this large end gauge series, eight of them, have uh, these dense spectrum, like spectrum behaves like this, where uh, and the rest of them has sparse spectrum. For a sparse, sparse theories, the gap between the operator dimension is order one, it doesn't scale with n, and you obtain a equals c at large n. And, uh, and that is correlated with, a, uh, with all n square scaling behavior. For the dense models, dense theories, the gap scales as one over n, and generically, they don't have uh, A equals C, and uh, A and C scales linearly in N. And for these dense models, uh, the C minus A can have either sign. So there's no uh, universality of the sign for this. But I mean, it's true that they become equal for the sparse theories. And, um, and the C minus A uh, the subleading pieces yeah. for the sparse cases, that's a different sign? Um, it can have either side. For the sparse case. For the sparse case. And yeah. just consistent with the uh, weekly calculated holographic viewers, you can calculate the subreading term for right. uh, uh, yes. A minus C, right? Yes, it, it's, it's just consistent. But the C minus A can have either signs, even for the sparse case. Okay. So, in this case, the eta over S bound is violated. Is that right? It is, it is violated if C is greater than A. Because that, that that puts a bound to uh, slightly one or five order. times some positive point. Yeah. yeah. That's not to be violated. Yeah, mm -hmm. that is known for many years. Yeah, that's better. I'm going to So, uh, how much time do I have? So, why did you say that you failed to find the swamp and condition? This seems like what what what's wrong? what uh, what is the problem? Well, the problem is that like I, I was hoping to find some something that holds for everything, but no, no, but that's just the task, I think. Not because uh, I think that swamp run condition, the way that I understand it, we come around chapter to me, is the condition for a weakly coupled gravitational theory, weakly coupled low energy effective theory, uh, which starts with Einstein gravity and the matter field and uh, and then then but the theory should be weakly coupled. So so I think it's Fine to restrict yourself to theory with the sparse spectrum. Absolutely. And then, then the question is that for this class of theory, is there any universality? And it seems like you're saying that there is indeed yes. universality of A and C, yes. but subleading term has some, but it may then it might be interesting to explore what this subleading correction behavior of this subleading correction. Yes. But so far, the subleading correction seems to be non non universal for the right. sparse theory. So but, but the theory also have. Uh, I mean, you can have either sign, so, sure, sure. so it does not. Uh... Uh, speaking about uh, making some small plan conjectures, uh, we have tried to uh, also test the weak graphic conjecture, uh, the ADS version of the weak graphic conjecture, all of these models. And we have found some weird uh, outliers, 
which doesn't seem to pass, uh, we can take consideration of that uh, Nakayama and Omura form. And actually, that is already pointed out in their original paper. For example, the SQCD in the Veneziano limit doesn't seem to satisfy it. Mm -hmm. There's no problem with that uh, because it, you don't really expect that to be weakly uh, uh, dual to the weakly coupled Einstein gravity. So that's perfectly fine. But we wanted to uh, find something that's a little more relaxed so that it also applies to arbitrary CFP. And uh, we, we, were, we were able to write down some conjecture, slightly loose a version of the refractory that seems to hold for every one of them. Uh, but yeah, <laughs> it's working about this. So is there any other kind of gravity that you might expect, like the higher spin theories that appear in these other, the dense ones? So, yes, uh, very good. So, because it's possible that you have two different swamp plant scenarios. One is with Einstein-like theories, and one with higher spin ones. Right. And they might have different features. Yes, yes, exactly. So these dense models reminds me of the, the higher spin gravity. Mm -hmm. So um, we have been thinking whether this has like, direct connection to higher spin gravity. But so far, it, I cannot really make it precise because uh, we have very limited uh, quantitative access to this theory. So you know, that's a very interesting question that I'd love to know an answer to, but so far, it's very tantalizing. I don't know about the things. So you haven't been able to study the higher spin spectrum no. of single trace operators. No. Like we, we only have this two like the operators in the coloring. So strictly in the BTS section. So there's so parts in which you can show that these dense models behave like vector models. This linear scaling of N maybe suggests so that that'd be great. <laughs> Yeah, I, I don't have any intelligent thing to say about that. But. So, 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 the, so this model uh, with dense spectrum, so they have much less density of state in high energy core, right? right. So, for, what, what, so what is causing this? There are, there are like, can, you said cancellations. So there are like more, so super, yeah. So but yeah, ca counting numbers. So you, you, you quoted the like Cardi like formulas earlier, uh, which are expressed yeah. by the exponential of C minus A or something. Mm -hmm. But that is uh, 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 for supersymmetric things, right? That's true. So this one, so this one tends to have more cancellation somehow than the first one for some reason. That's what happened. Um, about the cancellation, I'm not so sure. Uh, like at least technically what happens is that the the, the leading term of the central charge should involve the dimension of the gauge group, but that gets canceled by this funny um, scaling uh, of the... Oh, excuse me, I'm sorry, I, I, mean, I was mistaken. So the Cardi, yeah, okay, yeah, please, go ahead, yes. Yeah, yeah. so the, the N-squared term gets canceled uh, due to uh, this funny behavior of one over N. So n, there's n squared times one over n. That oh, really I think the connection between this kind of dense spectrum yes, yes, yes. and it, trans it turns out they are equivalent. So if oh. you have a and c that scales linearly n, then there has to be uh, this dense spectrum uh, oh, in the tensor-like representation. So if I don't have any tensors, then I don't I don't get. We need to have a, a tensor. Thank you. Did you question? Okay, so now I'd like to switch gears uh, and I'll try to be 15 minutes. 15 minutes. Okay. So I'll try to be quick. Um, I'm changing gears slightly and I'd like to uh, ask whether I can have A equals C for finite N uh, without uh, supersymmetry strength. So we have found that a, you, you can get A equals C for large N for sparse theories and you don't get for dense theories. But turning the question around, can you actually have A equals C for uh, finite N? And uh, so now I need to explain some background. Uh, so we were able to construct this. The answer is yes, uh, but that involves um, what's called the DPG theory. This was uh, studied by 
which I call the Azoto and Giacomelli and Dynasty and even long. Uh, and um, I, I think the quickest way to understand this is that if it uh, arises from the uh, fibrain theory, compacted by it on a, uh, on a sphere with two punctures, one being uh, what's called irregular puncture and the other being regular puncture. And the regular puncture parameterizes the flavor symmetry of this theory. And the irregular puncture uh, contains this integer parameter p, which has to do with the uh, degree of singularities uh, at this puncture. Uh, and uh, it has been all worked out by these people that uh, you can compute these numbers, uh, the flavor central charges where this is parameters by, uh, given by the number p and the uh, dual cocktail number of the flavor term. And it is especially simple when um, this theory possesses exactly uh, uh, G as a flavor symmetry without anything extra. And there's a condition for that. Uh, say for SUN, the P and N should be co prime, then uh, you get simply SUN. Uh, if there's a divisor, then you get some extra U1 factors. So that makes things slightly ugly. So I'm going to restrict to these cases. Anyway, uh, then uh, if I have some uh, CFT with a flavor symmetry, and I can try to couple that to a gauge field and make it inform in a kind of gauge theory. Uh, for n equals two theory, it, it, it remains that uh, one beta function to be zero, and that is tantamount to uh, requiring the sum of um, over the central charges for the individual copies to sum up to two h ten. So here I'm considering uh, copies of the PG theories where I um, gauge the diagonal flavor sum. And um, it turns out this condition uh, for, for the EPG model is simplifying just, just very simple equation. So you can, you can solve this uh, without using Mathematica by hand <laughs> to, to get that there's, there's exactly four answers. So that's not a high bro math. Uh, and somehow we, when we found that we are very thrilled, but later we learned that this has been already worked already worked out by uh, the, by friends uh, many 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 years ago. So like we just rediscovered this. Like uh, these are the ones which come from F theory, isn't that the case? These uh, numbers are familiar. These are the ones that you, we originally got from the F theory. From uh -huh. I think they just related to the symmetries of T two. And also. So, so the two, 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 three, 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 two, four, four. These are like the uh, numbers that has to do with the Comar copy affine D four, E six, E seven, E eight. So T two mod Z two, T two mod Z three, T T four mod Z four, and these are these are the relationships to torus. So, these numbers appear very frequently. <laughs> So we label, therefore we label these theories as uh, D4 had uh, the gamma hat G theories, where G stands for the, uh, the, the gauge group at the center. And this gamma refers to the shape of this quote unquote equivalent theory. And we, for 2 to 2, 2, this is a D4 hat uh, Deacon diagram. And for 3, 3, 3, this is E6 and so on. And, um, well, this, this theory has been really studied by some crying friends, for example, uh, in, as well, like they appeared many, many times before us, but our, uh, our modest contributions that we were able to compute central charges, well, they were able to compute central charges, but somehow uh, uh, they did notice that this theory has A equals C for finite N for every choice of G. And that looks a little bit bizarre if you think about holography, because in uh, in the holography, this the the difference between A and C appears as a correction to the supergravity effective action, because it, it appears as a coefficient of our uh, the Riemann square. So from the Sugara effective uh, field theory point point of view, there's no good reason for it to vanish. But somehow, uh, if you can construct the holographic dual of this theory. Then that should have vanishing a square term, the Riemann square term. 
So this is a little bit uh, bizarre. And these are the well, list of theories that we have found as A equals C. And um, there's some interesting properties of this. It resembles quite a bit with n equals four Cyprian males. Uh, for example, uh, this theory has no flavor symmetry besides n equals two superconformal symmetry. And it has exactly one marginal coupling, uh, just like n equals four. And it has a one form symmetry coming from the center of this uh, gauge group. And also, if you pick this gauge group to this specific, then you can also have two group symmetry and so on. The connection becomes uh, even more interesting if you look at uh, this, what's called the Shore index, a particular limit of the superconform index. Then uh, this theory is simply given by that of n equals for super young males with some reparameterization. So that uh, looks pretty. I was really fascinated about this, this thing. And moreover, uh, mathematicians have already known that. So we, by plugging into this, uh, this online encyclopedia of interior sequences, we have found that for this particular theory, uh, this is given in terms of, uh, the index is given in terms of what's called McMahon's generalized sum of divisor function. And uh, is proven, maybe, when it's actually quasi modular. So, Something is very interesting about that. So the uh, connection between n equals four super young males and this gamma hedge theory is probably more than just circumstantial. So there must be a reason behind this connection, but we don't really know uh, where this is coming from. Um, okay, well, we can further generalize this thing to n equals one theories. Um, like you, you might think that this a equals c theory is very scarce, but Turns out you can easily cook up A equals C theories with even less things to supersymmetry. So just, just mimicking similar construction with N equals one gauging, these models do have A equals C. Um, I'll just click with flash. And you can even further deform this theory uh, by adding superpotentials, but still um, possess A equals C property. And um, one remarkable fact is that Sure, you can cook up, easily cook up a Lagrangian theory that has A equals C. Just consider an A theory uh, with two adjoint fields. Then it has uh, A equals C. So um, that raises a question of whether uh, like it is actually, it seems to be scarce still, but uh, how common are these A equals C theories in the landscape of 40 CFPs? And also, I, uh, my question is, like, can we actually get rid of S? And not for non supersymmetry conformal field theories, can we have such a theory? I doubt it, but I mean, there was no reason a priori even for the n equals one. So <laughs> that's the question. All right, so uh, as a final remark, I want to mention that some interesting, this is a just comment about possible holographic beetle that so these gamma head G theory. Uh, if you do not restrict to uh, A equals C theories, then this is a natural generalization of the usual affine quiver gauge theories, uh, stud, uh, appearing in Douglas Moore, for example. So you can consider E6 uh, had SU3L, and this is just an E6 type quiver gauge theory that you can engineer from uh, in type 2B super string theory, like E3 brains probing C2 mod E6 singularity. Uh, you can you can get this for generic choice of this uh, gamma and G. It seems what we are doing is that instead of looking at this SU3L, like you can choose SUL. So it seems like I'm making this number of brains to be fractional. So it, it looks like I'm doing something like that uh, in the uh, double S more time construction with some extra like fractional charge. So uh, the natural question to wonder is that, can we actually real, um, make this dream come true? Can we actually realize this in string theory? Um, and actually there's one particular example that, that we know an answer to that is because there is D4 hat SUR theory, there's a classist realization. Uh, actually this is already uh, hidden in this V paper. 
uh, you can realize this from four puncture sphere. Um, Characterizes uh, with four twisted uh, twisted minimal punctures. So this is uh, characterizing in many ways. So I, I told you that the Schwar index has Schwar index of this theory is basically the Q goes to Q squared scaling of n equals four to three meals. And this is a, a four puncture sphere with two twist lines. So if you consider the double cover of that, you get a torus. So is that a coincidence? And moreover, uh, for this theory, uh, you can probably uh, follow Gaiot and Malacena to construct explicitly uh, study the gravity dual. So it would be interesting to see if there's a good reason to get A equals C from this perspective. So since time's up, let me try to wrap up. So uh, the conform anomalies of 40 CFTs capture interesting aspects of the theory. Um, and uh, we studied the scaling behavior of the central charges for the large A sphere. And it turns out that the, the sign of C minus A can have either signs. And also the central charge can scale uh, linearly or quadratically in N. So this is particularly uh, these are exotic ones that has uh, linear degrees of freedom and has the dense low line spectrum. And uh, also we sort of classified particular type of large dense superconform case series. And uh, we also tested radius version of the weak gravity conjecture. And what's very nice is that it seems the weak gravity conjecture was originally motivated from uh, weakly coupled gravity, but seems uh, it, go, it holds beyond the weakly coupled gravity. And we have found that there exists n equals one, two CFPs with a equals c. That's exactly in n. And there's a pantonism connection uh, to the n equals four to three m mills. And uh, this, this a equals c theory forbids this, this term, the supergravity uh, effective action. And it would be uh, very interesting to understand why. I think these two questions are especially interesting and it's fully related. Uh, and that's all I have. And finally, I'd like to congratulate, congratulate Hiroshi on his 60th birthday. And I, I really think I can't really thank him enough for all of his support and all of his teaching to me. And I, I really expect uh, the bright future right, for, for Hiroshi and uh, like our friendship to possible. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the next talk. So, question now, Cameron. Yes, uh, very nice talk. Uh, so, I have just comment about the about the reason for why n equals to four shows up and the explanation, which is which I think arose in a not unrelated context in the work we did with uh, with a number of our collaborators, which is the following questions: In which cases? So I'll give you one, two examples of it. N equal to two theories in four dimension. In which cases do the prepotential terms corrections vanish to all loops? We gave an explanation of why, when it happens on the explanation of why. Similar questions, then equals to one. When do you get no superpotential generated? What we found in both cases that they are secretly related to higher supersymmetric theories. And we, use, and we explained it using stream theory, why that works, how that works. And I suspect it's similar to here, namely, what we found was that if you start, for example, with a theory which is has a higher supersymmetry, if you compactify the theory, you can always, for example, orbifold. That will give you a lower supersymmetry theory. But if the orbifold has no free fixed points, then the mass sector of it doesn't know that the supersymmetry is lower. And in those cases, we could prove that there are no corrections to all of these quantities that we would have computed. So we call these that as if they're secret higher supersymmetry, even though it was not. The supersymmetry was reduced, but it behaved in that way, and we had the general proof of what it happens. So, in fact, we were interested in this precisely because we wanted to know which theories in 4D n equals to 1 can or cannot have super potentials. And we conjectured that it's a kind of a swampland statement that all n equals to 1 theories coupled to gravity will necessarily have W not equal to 0 unless they have this hidden supersymmetry structure. And so that was our motivation for that. Someday. So it's not really unrelated to swampland questions. Thank you very much. Thank you for the next one. Other questions from the audience members? Physical? 
Um, in these cases where A and C both grow like N at large N, um, are there any exactly marginal couplings in these theories? Oh, very good question. So um, among the examples that we tested, we couldn't find one, but okay, we didn't search these in an exhaustive fashion. So. Um, Okay, so, sure. so it, it piggybacks my previous question where when we see linear growth in some thing we call n, we think maybe this is a vector model or exhibits behavior like a vector model. And in familiar vector models, there, there are no exactly marginal operators. And so in trying to sort of answer the previous question, I'm asking this one. Um, the absence of them is consistent with the possible interpretation as a kind of vector model and that itself is suggestive of a higher spin kind of interpretation of the ball. So that's the comment. Yeah, okay, thank you very much. Yeah, we haven't really checked whether there, uh, there's an exactly marginal operator or not. Uh, I mean, it's for this particular example that I have shown you, it doesn't. Uh, but yeah, I can't really rule out the possibility yet. That's something to be done. Uh, maybe on the Zoom side, could you raise your hand and just speak up? Okay. Um, if you can ask a one question. Sure. The values of A and C in the n equals one case, are they rational or irrational? Oh, some of them are generically, uh, you're solving quadratic equations, so they are expected to be irrational, right. but algebraic. But sometimes there are uh, particular cases where you get rational numbers. So uh, actually, it'll be interesting to understand why you get rational numbers. Can you characterize the class of theory? No, I, I couldn't find a pattern among the rational and irrational ones. That, that question was in, was in my head for many years. <laughs> so far, I was not successful. You mentioned when also, the general G theory, when G happens to be SU with some particular number, is holographically dual to S5 over gamma. So, if the work is not a correct number, right? suppose you could a long along with a fictional amount of flux through S5 over gamma in supergravity and compute A and C. Do the numbers agree or? Um, okay, I think I tried to do some uh, along that line by just naively right. plugging in the wrong numbers, and I think it didn't work. Oh, I see. Yeah, we make the hand through the compensation of the slide correctly <laughs> on the super Yeah, well, possibly. I, I don't know. I mean, it would be fascinating if there's a way to yeah. fractionalize the term flux. Okay. Any other questions? So, can you explain the structure to a three point function in these theories? It involves the you know low spin light operator, but can you? I don't know how to do that. Like with this, uh, like we have only n equals one surface symmetry, so that uh, many of those surface symmetry localization does not work. Um, and this is extremely strongly coupled. Uh, I don't know how to do that. Any any idea? <laughs> no, that's pretty cool. <laughs> um, yeah, just asking the question because it, so you showed that the R squared correction in a would be holographic dual vanishes because of this condition. But if you can, the R cube term is encodes the other structure in in the TTT three point function, and if that doesn't vanish, then you know the higher spin gap is not large. So you can either study the spectrum of higher spin operators or this three-point function. And there's only two coefficients to check in the three-point function, and you've checked one, and then you should, by construction it vanishes. So if you check, you know, compute the value of the other one, and that actually can tell you whether this bulk theory is a higher spin yeah. gap theory or not, just by itself. I mean, that 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 would be great, but like so far, uh, my my control of, of this these theories are coming from the 
the fact that we have a gauge theory realization and we can complete trace analysis. So actually, that, that's all we can do. Maybe we can try to do supersymmetric index, but that's probably not useful. 